for you. Have we got a speaker for them? Yes, we've got a speaker for you. Um, everybody knows about the JFK assassination. Everybody pretty much knows about the 9-11, etc, etc. But not many people are actually aware that there's a conspiracy surrounding RMS Titanic. And if you don't know about that, I know a man who does. Can I ask you to give a big Thursday Club welcome to local researcher and author, Mr. John Hamer. to be here. It's great to see such a such a full house of people. I'm very, very disappointed that no one's not wearing masks or social distancing. <laughs> you know, what's going on? Now, for those who don't know me, my name's John Hamer. I've been an author and geopolitical researcher for about 20 odd years. And obviously, with the way things are at the moment, things really taking off, you know, w with my career and, what, and what's going on, and I'm being asked to speak all over the place, so I'm really grateful for being asked to come here um, to talk about the real story behind the Titanic disaster. But again, just for those who don't know me, I've just made a few notes here. Um, this is basically what I am described by the mainstream as being. Um, apparently, I'm a racist, misogynistic, homophobic, Holocaust denying, COVID denying, climate change denying, anti-vaxxer, anti-science, flat earther, and far right wing terrorist conspiracy theorist. <laughs> well, I'm glad you approve, that's really good. Seriously though, okay, let's go on with the serious business of tonight. Um, not a lot of people know exactly. <laughs> no, not a lot of people know exactly what went on with the Titanic, and and it, and so it kind of prompted me a few years ago to do some really in-depth research about it. And um, three years it took me actually to find out this information. And I think what I'm going to show you tonight, not all of it, but some of it is pretty unique to me. So, hopefully you're going to enjoy it. Let's, let's, let's crack on anyway and see where it takes us. Okay. So, I just want to say a few words about how history is systematically falsified. And that was actually the title of my first book, The Falsification of History. And there are a few little quotes there which I think are quite amusing. I especially like the first one. Any, anyone who has ever been to the musical Wicked will re maybe remember that quote. I just think it's really, really funny. Um, but obviously, of course, there's a lot of other people besides themselves and your good selves that believe that history is just basically a lie. Okay, so, you know, I get accused of being this all the time, as well as all those other labels that apply to me. I'm just a conspiracy theorist. But what is a conspiracy theory? Well, for those of you not aware, it was coined by the CIA in the aftermath of the JFK assassination to shut down people who were coming up with all these highly implausible theories that it was all a big setup. Uh, and now, of course, they use it to discredit anybody who, uh, who opposes what the mainstream tells us. So, yeah, so again, yeah, it's a term used by the mainstream media to slander anyone who questions their monopoly on the truth. I think we all realise that. So, it begs the question, how easy is it for them to fool all, or most of the people, all of the time? Um, you all probably recognise this ship because it's been thrust at us from, you know, from 
being this high to cradle to grave really. So this is really sticks in our consciousness, this ship. So we all know which, which ship this is when we see this picture. Sorry? There's no way of turning it up, oh, sorry. Like that. Is that better? Is that better? Can you hear now? Woo! <laughs> sitting at the front, that's why. <laughs> Okay, everyone, back on stream then, okay. So yeah, we all know what that picture represents. Or do we? That was actually a picture of RMS Olympic, not the Titanic. Okay, so you see what I mean? It's very, very easy to fool everyone all the time. So there are certain things that we know for certain about what happened on that dreadful night. But actually, it is surprisingly little. We know, for example, that a very large ship sank in the North Atlantic on the 15th of April, the early hours of. Uh, we know that about 1,500 people died. And we know that 700 survivors were re rescued by the Carpathia. But almost everything else is really, really up for grabs. And trust me, you will see what I mean very soon. Okay. So let's have a look at the facts. Um, yeah, I did my research on this, as I say, for about three years, and, and, and the sources that I looked at were the transcripts of the US inquiry. There were two inquiries, British and US, and I looked at both of those. Um, I looked at Harland and Wolf public records. Harland and Wolf, for those of you who don't know, was the shipyard that built the Titanic in, uh, in Belfast. And I also looked at various other resources, such as archives and public libraries, and of course the internet, which um, is getting more heavily censored by the day, of course, but at that time it was pretty, uh, pretty okay. And the conclusion that I came to was that there were so many unanswered questions and anomalies with the official story that I just thought, this is not right, there's something wrong here. So I carried on and I realized very quickly that the official story was nothing more than a combination of white star line propaganda, extremely conflicting eyewitness accounts, contemporary newspaper fiction, <laughs> where have we heard that story before, and misleading conclusions of the inquiries. There was also a massive British and US governmental cover-up, which again we'll come on to through the talk, and, and again, unsurprisingly, a coordinated media cover-up. Stop me if you've heard this story before. Yeah, but a lot of the official story that we know and believe to be true is based on a book and a feature film based on that book called The Night to Remember. Now, the book was written in about 1953, I think, or four, and the film was, uh, came out in 1958. Okay, so that's the book, A Night to Remember, and that was a poster for the film, A Night to Remember, starring Kenneth Moore, the famous old British actor. Now, who was the guy who wrote A Night to Remember? This, this was the first thing that occurred to me to look at, because this often tells you, uh, you know, much more than you would gather from any, any other source, really. Now, Walter Lord, okay, he was actually an intelligence analyst, in other words he worked for the CIA. Now this begs the question, what on earth would a CIA agent be doing writing the definitive account of a shipping disaster 40 years previously? Well again, alarm bells start to ring and you think, there's got to be a reason for this. Okay, so let's move on to setting the scene a little bit. 
Okay, does anyone here know the approximate date that the wreck of the Titanic was discovered and who did it? Don't be frightened to shout out. No? Okay. Well, allegedly it was discovered by a guy called Robert Ballard in 1985, and, uh, but in actual fact that was wrong. Okay. You see, I was hoping somebody would come out with it, so then I, that would have been quite dramatic when I came up with that sorry wrong. But, uh, yeah. So, would you believe it was actually discovered in 1953? Okay, so about 30 years earlier than they told us. Okay. It was reported in most of the press at the time, but it's now been conveniently overlooked, as with lots of other instances of stuff like this. Okay. Um, and in 1953, the newspapers reported that a British naval expedition was attempting to recover the cargo. How strange. Okay. Now, this is a newspaper headline, although this stuff is not legible, and I do apologize for that. What it's actually saying is that they, were, they sent out a ship to try and dive to the Titanic wreck looking for one billion dollars worth of lost gold. Okay, just like that thinking, a billion dollars worth of gold they reckon was on there. Okay. So, yeah, there we go. One billion dollars of gold bullion. In fact, even though it was allegedly discovered in 1953, there is strong evidence to suggest that it was actually known all along where the wreck was. And I mean by, what I mean by all along is from 1912 when it actually sank. Okay, uh, one or more British naval vessels had been tracking the ship on its voyage, and again, this just, you know, being the inquisitive soul that I am, this kind of sets alarm bells ringing in my head when I read and find out that British naval vessels had not only been in the vicinity of the ship when it sank, but they were also tracking the ship throughout its entire voyage. Now, very strange. But why would they cover it up? Let's see. Okay. So as I say, it was allegedly discovered by Robert Ballard of Woods Hole Oceanographic, Oce Oceanographic Institute. Um, but as well as being a, uh, a, a member of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Robert Ballard was, and in fact still is to this day, a US government intelligence operator. In other words, he works for the CIA. And we begin to spot a pattern here. Okay. So, actually, Ballard was on an expedition not to find the Titanic, as we were told. He was on an expedition to investigate the wreck of a US submarine which was carrying nukes and which had sunk in the North Atlantic. And they were using the Titanic search as a kind of a blind to deceive Russian subs in the area which they knew were tracking them and Ballard said I don't know can you all read that screen or do you want me to read it I'll read it my mission was to find those reactors and find those weapons but we didn't want the Soviets to know that we were doing that or they put a satellite on us and we'd lead them to our submarines we needed a cover and so I suggested the Titanic and so we then went out and actually did our covert, covert operations and then went and did the Titanic. So, let's start at the very beginning now, shall we? Let's just set the scene. Let's go back in time now to the year 1903. There was a famous industrialist and financier called J.P. Morgan, whose name still lives on today in the name of his company, J.P. Morgan Guarantee Limited. J.P. Morgan actually purchased the British White Star Line in 1903. And the British government actually sanctioned that purpose because, at that time, it was not legal for a foreign national to own a British shipping line. So the British government did sanction the purchase, but with certain conditions attached, and we'll come on to that later. But there's Mr. Morgan himself, lovely man, not. Um, so moving on to 1907, Morgan decided to uh, open up new markets, if you like, for his shipping line. And he decided to make the focus on, rather than speed, which had always been the case in transatlantic crossings, 
it was always speed. He decided to make it the opposite to that and make it all about luxury. And by doing that, it, it hoped to it, uh, attract very wealthy clients. And we'll see that he actually did that. So in 1907, work commenced at Harlan and Will's Shipyard in Belfast to build the three sister ships, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. And these were going to be, and indeed were, the largest moving objects ever built. Olympic and Titanic were the first two off the production line, Olympic being the first, and these two were virtually identical. Britannic itself wasn't built until after the Titanic incident. So we're just gonna concentrate on those two for now. Okay, now, there are two elements to this story. First of all, J.P. Morgan's financial chicanery, in other words, his, um, shall we say, uh, <laughs> yeah, his, his um, yeah, well, his financial chicanery, I can't think of a better word for that, really. And then the actual story of the ship itself and the accident. Okay, so, going back to Morgan again, in 1910, seven high-powered financiers met at a place called Jekyll Island uh, off the coast of Georgia in USA. And these were the representatives of the three big financial organizations in America at that time, well indeed the world, and that was J.P. Morgan Associates, the Rothschild and the Rockefeller organizations. Now you've probably all heard these names before in conjunction with lots of other nefarious stuff. Okay. And this meeting took place in absolute secrecy. There were no surnames used for security, and it was to plan the foundation of the Federal Reserve Bank. For those of you who don't know what the Federal Reserve Bank is, it's the American equivalent of the Bank of England. And it is the American Central Bank, which generates all the currency on behalf of the American government. Okay, now, this wasn't all straightforward because there was some very, very powerful opposition to the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, so, why was the Federal Reserve Bank so important to these elite financiers? Well, this might sound really strange to you who have not gone that far down the rabbit hole yet, but they needed to finance World War I, which was already, believe it or not, in the planning at this point in time. I know this sounds really fantastic and utterly improbable, but trust me, it is the case. World War I was planned in the 1890s, but they didn't have the finance to make it happen. So they thought, well, let's, let's, let's institute a central bank give it the power to create currency from thin air, which is what the, all central banks do, by the way, for those of you not aware, they create money out of thin air, and using that tactic, it gives them the unlimited financial power to do virtually anything they want. And so this is what they did. This is why the Federal Reserve Bank was actually mooted and, tri and set up, okay? It was to finance World War I. Okay, and this of course was the beginning of the US national debt. Up until that point in time, the American government had created their own currency, so they didn't have to pay interest to a private company, which the Federal Reserve Bank obviously is. Well, they say obviously. Now, as I mentioned, there were powerful interests opposing it. Um, one of those guys was Charles Lindbergh Sr. Now, you may have heard the name Charles Lindbergh in connection with his son, who was a famous aviator and who flew the Atlantic in the 1920s, but this is the father, this is Charles Lindbergh Sr. And he was a US congressman, and he was not in favor of the, the, the Federal Reserve at all. And neither was a guy called Benjamin Guggenheim, who was, a, again, he was a big in American industrialist, he was into mining and railroads. Okay, and a guy called John Jacob Astor, who was regarded as being the richest man in the world at that time. He was into the leisure industries, hotels, etc. And a guy called Isidore Strauss, who was, uh, he had some banking interests, but he was basically concerned with um, retail. He owned the department store Macy's, and again, he was a very, very rich guy. Now, why would these guys be opposed to the Federal Reserve? These were four of the richest men in the world. Okay, well, 
they knew that the Federal Reserve would undermine their own personal fortunes because of the way the central banking system works. It creates money out of thin air and it charges governments interest on loaning them the money in just the same way that the Bank of England charges our government for loaning its money to them, in other words, to the people. Okay, that might come as a surprise to some people, that is absolutely true. So, um, they knew that the Federal Reserve Plan would undermine their own personal fortunes because the inherent thing about central banking systems is that it causes massive inflation. And this is the real reason for inflation. Not trade deficits, not any other paltry excuses that governments and their talking heads come out with. It's the fact that the central banks charge the government, and therefore us, taxpayers, for the privilege of them loaning our own money to ourselves. So they knew this was the case, and it would undermine their own fortunes through massive inflation. Okay, there you go, extreme inflation. And it could even possibly destroy their fortunes, and this is what they were really worried about. And strangely enough, after the Federal Reserve was established in 1913, J.P. Morgan, who happened to be a major shareholder in the Federal Reserve, actually acquired their business interests. Lucky him. Okay. Now, J.P. Morgan, strangely, or maybe not, was also the largest shareholder in IMM, which was the umbrella group that owned the White Star Line. And this was also the, the line that owned the line of California. And again, this will become significant as we go on. This is what Henry Ford had to say in 1918. It's well enough that people do not understand our banking and money system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. And J. Edgar Hoover in 1946 said, the individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. Very true. Now, let's talk about Atlantic crossings in the 19th century. Many passengers were, were emigrating to America at that time, as we all probably know, uh, but most of these were very, very poor immigrants who were going to seek a better life. And as a result of that, there was, there was no real restrictions on numbers on ships, and a lot of them were blatantly overloaded. Um, and ships were also well over-insured as well, and insurance scams were common. And again, this is going to be significant as we move on. Okay. And it was even, believe it or not, an industry absolutely noted for fraudulent practices. Now, the first off the production line was Titanic's big sister, or twin sister rather than big sister, um, which was launched in early 1911. And she was the first off the production line of the twins. Her voyage was on, maiden voyage was on the 14th of June 1911. And almost immediately, she had a really bad accident. She, on a main voyage, she almost sunk an American tug in New York Harbor, and the White Star Line was sued for 10,000 pounds, which doesn't sound very much these days, but that was a, a fortune then. You know, you're looking at several million, probably. Um, okay, and then it had another mishap as well, very, very shortly afterwards, when it ran over a sunken wreck, and the starboard propeller had to be replaced by the still being built Titanic at that point. And then the worst thing that happened to the Olympic in September 1911, well, well obviously while well, Titanic was still being built, it was involved in a huge, disastrous collision with a Royal Naval battleship called HMS Hawk, which is known as the Hawk Incident. And sadly for the White Star Line and J.P. Morgan, the damage was far more severe than they first thought. Okay, now that's the battleship HMS Hawk, or the battle cruiser HMS Hawk, and you can't see from that picture but it actually, just under the waterline at the front there, it had a huge battering ram, which was designed to inflict damage on other ships. Okay, now it hit 
RMS Olympic amidships right in the middle and it did absolutely devastating damage. Okay, um, there was a huge hole and all the steel frames were buckled on that side. The, 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 the battering ram penetrated right into the middle of the ship and did all sorts of damage. I mean, it cracked and distorted the prop shaft. Thousands of rivets were popped. Thousands of plates were, were needed replacing. And yeah, they were all bent and distorted and broken across four decks. So it was huge damage. And, but the worst of all, as you can see on the bottom of that screen there, the keel was bent and twisted. Now, I had several conversations with mariners who told me that a bent and twisted keel is equivalent to a wrecked ship. Okay, so the ship is completely knackered. All right, that, that is the... I don't know if you can, that's, that's man there, if you can't see it properly. But that was the extent of the damage, but it actually went much, much higher than that, and right into the middle of the ship, and actually bent the keel. So, absolutely severe damage to RMS Olympic. So, as I said, the major problem was the bent and twisted keel, which caused a dramatic list to port. Okay, and even, so it, it, it limped back to Southampton. This, this collision took place just off the Isle of Wight, actually. But it limped back into Southampton Harbour, and it took two weeks just to make temporary patches in order to get it back to Belfast, which had the only dry dock in the world big enough to take it, because don't forget, this was the biggest ship in the world at that time. So, in October 1911, a full damage assessment took place. Now, in parallel with that, there was a Royal Naval Inquiry, because any accident to a Royal Navy ship had to be subject to one of their own inquiries. Now, the crew of the Olympic, perhaps not surprisingly, were found guilty of causing the accident, even though from all the evidence I've examined, it was absolutely, definitely the battle cruiser that was at fault. But of course, the Royal Navy had the power to make the Olympic gu guilty, and so that is exactly what they did. Okay, uh, so, White Star Lines Insurer, which was Lloyds of London, declined the claim, declined the insurance claim. Now, JP Morgan had invested millions into this project, absolutely millions, and he was now in a massive hole, a huge hole, because not only did he have to pay for the uh, repairs to the Olympic, uh, he also had to pay for the repairs to the, uh, the uh, HMS Hall, the Royal Navy ship. And these damage costs were several millions, and you know, okay, a million pounds, several millions is a lot of money these days, but you know, 100 and, nearly 110 years ago, several millions was several hundred millions, okay. So this was a big problem for, for Morgan, and he definitely faced bankruptcy because of this, okay. Now, I believe, or they believed, that the ship was actually irreparable. Totally irreparable, because as I say, a bent keel makes a ship wreck. So basically they had two options, scrap it or patch it up. Even the patch up took seven weeks. And don't forget all the time that Olympic is in the dry dock in Belfast, it's losing revenue. Okay, so it's not able to ply its trade back and forward across the Atlantic. So it, this is a huge money pit now that Morgan and his White Star Line are falling into, and they're getting desperate. Okay, they replaced the plates along a third of the ship's length, so you can see a huge undertaking. They put steel struts in place to brace the keel, and we'll come back to that one near the end. That's why I highlighted it in red. Okay, and they also borrowed the starboard propeller from Titanic. Uh, which was still under construction at that time. So, in January 1912, it had yet another collision. 
even though they put it back into service, it had another collision, so it was really was a jigsaw ship, and it lost a propeller blade, which necessitated it, necessitated it coming all the way back from New York to Southampton, but it suffered severe vibrational damage, which caused enormous stress on this already badly damaged ship. So things are just getting worse and worse and worse. Now, interestingly, the propeller blade replacement should have taken a few hours, but actually took four days. So what, what were they doing at that point in time? Now, Olympic and Titanic were photographed several times together in Belfast around this time, and there are lots of pictures of them both together in the dockyard. Um, now, at this point in time, significantly maybe, the original Titanic maiden voyage date, which was 20th of March, was put back to the 10th of April. Okay. Now, there's the Olympic and the Titanic together. It's very hard to tell the difference, but there are some uh, differences. Now, this is, this is uh, Titanic, and that's Olympic. Now, the, the, only reason I can, the only way I can tell from that photo is because this part here on the Olympic is open. Whereas on the Titanic, sorry, it's the other way around, the ring pardon. That's, that's Olympic, that's Titanic. Because on Olympic, that deck is open where it's enclosed on Titanic. That's one of the few ways that you can tell the difference. Okay, now. Okay, so as I say, the forward part of A deck was enclosed on Titanic. And also, on Olympic, at the beginning, at the, at the very front of the ship, the bow, it had 16 portholes which were unevenly spaced, whereas Titanic had 14 portholes evenly spaced. And the forward part of sea deck, as I said before, on Titanic it was enclosed, on Olympic it was open. Okay, so let's see some interesting pictures here. Now, this was Olympic's public viewing day, um, before its maiden voyage, and you can quite clearly, well, maybe not from back there you can, but I'll, I promise you that there are 16 portholes there. Um, and an open sea deck, which is this bit here. Okay, so that's open. It's enclosed on Titanic. Okay. Now, at Titanic's launch, it had 14 portholes. Okay, so that was the difference, one of the differences between Titanic and Olympic. And you'll see where this is going very soon. Um, just bear with me. Now, interestingly, Titanic's maiden voyage is suddenly acquired two extra portholes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that it's got the, it's suddenly acquired the Olympic configuration of portholes at the front. Now, again, a picture of Titanic under construction. You can clearly see the, well, again, the 14 portholes. I have to say, you probably can't clearly see it back there, but trust me, it's definitely true. Now, Interestingly, we know that Olympic had 16 bow portals and Titanic had 14 on launch. But, as I said, on Titanic's maiden voyage, several photos clearly show 16 portals. And on the Olympic, there are several photos showing 14 portals even after Titanic's loss. Now, Olympic was also open to the public prior to the maiden voyage, but not Titanic. Why would that be? Well, again, I'll come on to that. Plus, any ship that was given an ocean-going seaworthiness certificate had to undergo what were called sea trials, which basically spent, meant spending a day at sea with a Board of Trade inspector on board, and it put, them, put it through the ship through several different trials and tests to make sure everything was functioning from a safety point of view. In these days we call it health and safety, but and then it was a board of trade inspection. Okay, now Titanic sea trials, as with any other ship, it should have been a full day on the open sea, but in fact Titanic's was just a brief one to two hour jaunt down Belfast Lock, which is not even out into the open sea. There are no speed tests, 
and no full lifeboat tests. And I know this for a fact, okay, so you've got to take my word on this. Now, as well, interestingly, the crew, when Titanic docked in Southampton, ready for its maiden voyage, out of the several hundred crew who had taken it down from Belfast to Southampton to begin its maiden voyage, only two, only two out of several hundred signed up for the voyage. I, I found that very strange, but again, maybe not when you understand the reasons why. Um, but the other thing to mention is at this point in time, round about Titanic's maiden voyage, there was a, a massive coal strike, countrywide coal strike going on. It had been going on for about six weeks. There were no ships crossing the Atlantic because they couldn't get the coal, because obviously in those days all, all ships were powered by coal and steam. Uh, and so people were out of work. And if you were in the shipping industry and you were out of work, you didn't get paid. So if you were not signed up on a contract for a voyage, and they got paid voyage by voyage, by the way, so if you weren't actually working, you didn't get paid. So people had been out of work for six weeks, and of course there was no dole, no social security in there at those days. So people were desperate. And yet, only two firemen and stokers signed up for the voyage, for the maiden voyage, out of the uh, transit crew who took it down from Belfast to Southampton. And most of those said that they would not sail on her again. Okay. As I say, even during a coal strike when people were desperate for jobs. So my conclusion therefore is that this is probably not going to come as a surprise to you. <laughs> White Star Line, in collusion with Harland and Wolf Shipyard, and the British and American governments switched the identities of the two ships. We're not having a five minute break, I was for another session. Okay, so how and why would they make the switch? Okay. As I say, Olympic was worthless, not virtually worthless, she was worthless, she had actually been declared a wreck, okay? So it's like, if you have a bad accident in your car, and you, you know, it's, it's an insurance write-off. That's exactly what Olympic was, okay? It was damaged beyond economic repair. But JP Morgan was desperate, he was losing tens of millions of pounds in 1912 money, not in 2021 money. And he was desperate, okay? Um, so White Star Line and Howland and Wolf would definitely have been bankrupted without an insurance payout, which they definitely weren't going to get. So did J.P. Morgan see an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone? Okay, now, three of those Federal Reserve opponents were actually on board the Titanic. And that was Benjamin Guggenheim, John Jacob Astor, and Isidore Strauss. Now it would have been if he was going to if he was going to plan to get rid of his opponents, it would have been too dangerous to plan separate accidents. Somebody might have noticed if all of a sudden the three major opponents to J.P. Morgan's scheme befell terrible accidents. So who would suspect in the aftermath of a disaster that they'd actually been murdered? Now, let's talk about Captain Smith of the Titanic a little while. He, totally contrary to uh, reports today, he, was, he had an absolutely appalling safety track record. Dreadful it was. He was known as a huge show off. He had several serious accidents in his career. And uh, three of them on the Olympic, because he was also the captain of the Olympic for the short time that the Olympic was uh, around and running. So those three accidents that the Olympic had were all under the captaincy of Captain Edward Smith. Okay, he also, he also captained the Republic, the Germanic, the Coptic, and the Majestic. And the a Majestic accident, several crew members were killed. And this was actually blamed on Smith, but somehow he led a charmed life and he was allowed to keep his job and his career. 
Okay, now Wazzy brought, brought into Bruce Ismay's confidence. Now Bruce Ismay was the managing director of the White Star Line. Um, he wasn't the owner, he hadn't been the owner until uh, JP Morgan bought the line. But Wazzy brought into Ismay's confidence and his record, his appalling track record, used as a lever to coerce him into going along with their plans. I believe that he was told that Californian, which is the ship that I mentioned earlier on, uh, which was also owned by JP Morgan, would be standing by. And indeed the Californian was standing by when the accident happened, but we'll come on to this very soon. Okay. Now Smith insisted on choosing his own crew, which under normal circumstances was totally taboo. The captain wasn't allowed to do that. It was, the, um, it was the owners of the line that, that, that chose crews, or the admin of the owners of the lines that chose their own crew. Okay. Now, and the seniority order of the existing officers were affected. Now again, was this a kind of a ruse so that Smith could actually bring his most trusted uh, colleagues into the, into the plot as well? and move those that he didn't trust down out of the way. Now this caused a lot of consternation and a lot of uh, criticism at that time, but again, of course, we don't hear about it these days. But he definitely promoted and demoted several individuals, which was highly irregular. Okay, a few more anomalies. Okay, as I said, um, Despite the coal strike, which had been going on for a long time, Titanic still had difficulty finding crew. Okay. There were thousands out of work, so what did they know? I mean, why would they refuse work, especially on such a prestigious maiden voyage as the Titanic? What did they know? Okay. Chief, Chief Officer Wilde, who was second in command to Captain Smith, actually sent a letter to his sister saying, I still don't like this ship. What did he mean by I still don't like this ship? He'd never been on it before. It was his maiden voyage. He'd been on the Olympic, he'd been chief officer on the Olympic for all its voyages. So why would he say to his sister, I still don't like this ship? Draw your own conclusions. Okay. Now, funnily enough, Olympic's maiden voyage, even though it had no fanfare associated with it whatsoever, it was fully booked up. First class, second class, third class, all sold out. Now, Titanic, and again, this is a, a very little known fact, it was only half full. And again, I, I draw your attention to the fact that there was a huge coal strike going on, and there was no other ships leaving Britain at that point in time for America. And yet it was still only half full. And I believe this was artificially restricted by the White Star Line because they knew what was going to happen out in the ice field and they wanted to make the rescue effort manageable. Okay, so they didn't want a full ship, which would have been 4,000 plus people. They wanted it manageable. So they actually only offered first class passengers who wanted to transfer to Titanic, they only offered them second class cabins. Now in those days, what self-respecting first class passenger would accept a second class cabin? None, trust me. Now also, 50 first class passengers cancelled their reservations on Titanic at the last moment, and these were all friends and colleagues of JP Morgan. JP Morgan himself was due to sail on the ship, but he uh, telegrammed an hour before it was due to sail to say he couldn't make it and they'd have to go without him. Now, the excuse he gave that he was very unwell. Now, he was interviewed the, that very same day with his mistress in a French holiday resort. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Two days after the sinking, he was also interviewed by, uh, sorry, uh, seen in perfect health in a French Royal Holiday Resort with his mistress. But he was actually interviewed that very same day as well, okay. 
Now Florence Ismay, it was Bruce Ismay, the White Star Line Managing Director, it was his wife, she also changed her mind about sailing at the last moment, feigning illness. But again, she departed on a motoring holiday in Ireland. All very strange. Now this is the SS Californian, which was part of the Red Star Line, which was also owned by JP Morgan. And this was allocated as being the rescue ship. Now some of you may be familiar with the official story and all the stuff that went along with SS Californian, but don't worry, I'm gonna cover it all anyway. Um, okay, this was the ship that according to the Titanic legends, and they are only legends, was nearest to it at the point of its sinking. Okay, now, Californian, and this is really, really interesting, bear with me, had a top speed of 12 knots, which was just about half that of Titanic. And Californian, again in the midst of a coal strike, with coal barely available, managed to leave London uh, five days before Titanic. That meant that it would get to the ice field where the incident took place at exactly the same time as Titanic, because Titanic left five days later, and it was twice the speed. Now, there you go. So, fortuitously, as I say, 10 days later, that put California in exactly the same ice field as the Titanic at the same time. Now, it managed to get a full complement of coal from somewhere, nobody knows where or how, but strangely enough, it had no passengers. And again, this is in the, at the time of the coal strike, when people were clamoring for passengers across the Atlantic. There were huge waiting lists of people wanted to go uh, you know, across to America, okay? Now, it had no cargo either, except, does anyone want to give a guess what the cargo was? No, 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 sorry, no, I'm probably misleading you there, aren't I? Okay, 3,000 woolen sweaters and 3,000 woolen jumpers. Oh, I wonder what that could refer to. Okay, now this is Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian, who, who became the scapegoat to the Titanic disaster. He was blamed for it all. Right, so on the 14th of April, which is the day before the disaster, Californian stopped dead in the middle of the ice field. And, Cali and Captain Lord decided to spend the night on a small sofa in the chart room, fully clothed. What could he have been expecting? Now, Stanley Lord was six foot four, so I'm sure he spent a very, very uncomfortable night indeed, and for what reason? Okay, he also ordered, whilst the ship was dead stopped, he also orders the bo ordered the boilers to be kept fully fired. And the crew were kept on standby right throughout the night. As I say, what was he expecting? So back at the Titanic, there was a huge fanfare and build up to the maiden voyage, unlike for the Olympic, which after all, don't forget, was the first one off the production line. So why the big emphasis on the, on the fanfare around Titanic? It's all very strange. You know, um, was it to attract the great and good in huge numbers onto the Titanic? or the ones that J.P. Morgan wanted to be attracted to come onto the Titanic. Um, he, up, he obviously, to me, sent personal invitations, especially to Guggenheim, Strauss, and Astor, I believe, but there were lots of other famous people on board too. Okay. Much of the American high society was on board. Now, Altogether, Titanic received six messages, wireless messages, on the old Morse code, because they didn't have audible wireless in those days, it was just Morse code. Um, so he received six mes messages late on the evening of 14th of April, which is when the uh, disaster struck. Three of them were warnings of icebergs. 
and three were personally addressed to Captain Smith from Captain Ward of the Californian. All containing the precise location of where California had stopped for the night. Now again, this is all a bit strange, isn't it, when you think about this logically. Why on earth would Captain Lord need to inform Captain Smith exactly where California had stopped for the night? I just find that very puzzling, or maybe not, <laughs> as the case may be. Now, Smith actually turned the ship westwards on the autumn southern track for 10 miles, and this actually put Titanic directly into the ice field. Okay. And Titanic's radio operators, unknown to Smith at the time, were busy with passenger messengers, messengers. Uh, so they weren't particularly taking notice of the ice warnings that were coming through. And they did not receive Californians' last messages, or if they did, they definitely didn't pass them on to Captain Smith. Someone's having fun. Um, now there were several other ships in the ice field that night, all travelling full speed. Now when Lord, in the American Inquiry, was asked why California had stopped dead for the night, he said because he didn't want to travel through the ice field at speed at night. Now, this goes totally against maritime code. It was well known that you always travel at full speed through an ice field because icebergs are so visible, even in the dead of night, that you don't need to slow down. You get plenty of warning to avoid them. Okay, so as I say, California stopped and closed down for the night, according to Lord, because of this danger of the ice field and the danger to the ship. Now that's probably not very visible, but that was, that was Titanic's uh, route. And here was, here's, you can't see it properly, but just trust me, the, the ice field is there now. It, sorry. <laughs> I'll move on anyway. Um, yeah. If it carried on for 10 miles further and then turned west, it would have avoided the ice field altogether, but it appears on the surface of it that it actually deliberately steered into the ice field. Now, at 11 p.m., lookouts Fred Fleet and Reginald Lee were on duty. And funnily enough, Captain Smith also decided to spend that night fully clothed on a sofa. Now, at 11.35 p.m., the iceberg was sighted and a warning was sent to the bridge. And the helmsman was ordered to port around it, which is a technical term for actually turning starboard, which sounds weird. Port is left, starboard is right. But that's maritime terminology. It was told to port around it. Okay. At, but, that would have been fine, that would have worked, no question about it, but unfortunately the engines were inexplicably reversed, which guaranteed a collision. The momentum of the ship, when turning to starboard, sorry, when turning to port, would have actually taken it around the iceberg, but by reversing the engines, the momentum stopped and it guaranteed a collision. Okay. Now, on board Titanic, there was a, a, a seaman of Austro-Hungarian nationality. Uh, Austro-Hungarian being because at that time, those two countries were the same entity, Austria and Hungary, part of the, um, uh, the Aus Austrian uh, Empire. Uh, and he was called Louis Klein. Now, Louis Klein was actually subpoenaed to appear at the American Inquiry when that was convened after all the survivors reached New York, uh, but he never showed up. But his testimony was read out, but ignored. How do I know this? Because it's in the Inquiry transcript for anyone to find and see. Now, you'll find this, I think, very interesting. I'll come on to that in a minute. But he was obviously a witness to exactly what happened, but of course this is never mentioned in any contemporary Titanic story. 
Um, he actually claimed that most of the on-duty crew were drunk, and he claimed that the lookouts were asleep on duty, and he said they saw the iceberg when it was at least five miles away, which should have given them ample time to, move, to steer around it. Now, Lufthansa couldn't speak any English. He shouted a warning to the lookout and to the bridge, but there was no one there. Let that sink in for a minute. There was no one on the bridge at the time of the accident. No one. Okay, apart from an officer, which was William Murdoch, lying motionless, believed drunk, on a bench. Now, on arrival at New York, he was placed under house arrest and subpoenaed, as I say, but he escaped and failed to show up at the inquiry. Now, here is his written testimony, which is translated from German, which was in native language, and submitted to the inquiry, but absolutely no notice whatsoever was taken of this. And here it is. Now, because that's quite small, I'll read it out, so please do excuse me. Here's what Klein had to say. He said, there was a ball following a banquet of some kind going on down below when I went up on watch at 9.30 o'clock. And the captain and the officers were there with many passengers. After the party, the stewards sent the champagne and wines that were left over to the crew. I know that many of them were drunk. A passenger standing at the rail saw something dead ahead or maybe a little to the starboard. Look, quick, see the hill over there. I saw it was a big iceberg and ran for the bridge. The third officer was coming and yelped to me to ask what the matter was. I couldn't stop to answer. I was too excited. I ran for the spar with the crow's nest on it and shouted to the lookout I knew was up there to give the alarm. Not a word did I hear, so I started up the spar. It was less than a minute after I left the promenade deck that I got to the top of the spar and found the lookouts fast asleep. I rang the alarm bell myself. Lewis Klein. So, did Murdoch, who was on duty, or allegedly supposed to be on duty in the bridge at that time, under explicit instructions, deliberately guide Titanic into an iceberg? Now, interestingly, the turning circle of Titanic was 1,280 yards, which is roughly two-thirds of a mile. Okay? And the stopping distance from full speed was 850 yards which is just under half a mile. Now, they could have easily avoided the iceberg, even seeing it as late as they claimed that they did. Okay, because second officer Lightoller, who was a senior surviving officer of all of them, said that the iceberg was visible from two miles. Now, he stated this in inquiry. So, the inquiry never followed up on this. They never asked these pertinent questions at all, which, of course, they never do when there's a whitewash going on. So the conclusion from that is that the iceberg should have easily been avoided if it was meant to have been avoided. Okay. Now, only six witnesses officially to the event survived. Sorry, there were only six witnesses to the event of whom only four survived, and these are all working class men. Now, those working class people, in those days, it was so easy to coerce them into doing what they were told because the threat of their livelihoods was always a big issue for them. If they were told that if they said anything that they were supposed to say that they would never work again and neither would any of their families, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're not going to defy them because you get no help from the government. You know, you're going to starve to death. So it's significant that only four of them, all working class, survived. So these are the only four that actually knew what really went on. Now, first officer Murdoch, who was the guy who was allegedly drunk on a bench at the back of the, uh, the bridge, he allegedly committed suicide in the aftermath. Um, but, you know, th that is contentious. Some people don't believe it, but I think it's perfectly plausible. If he was drunk and he believed that he was uh, re responsible for the accident in effect, then I think it's perfectly plausible. It's also alleged that he actually shot some passengers as well who were trying to storm the lifeboat. Because 
when we see these Titanic documentaries and Titanic films, uh, you know, feature films, it all looks very, you know, okay, not calm, that's probably the wrong word, but it looks very ordered, everybody's being reasonable, everybody's being, you know, polite, and, but actually, it was absolute mayhem. There were people storming the lifeboats, there were fights, there were people, all sorts of mayhem going on. So, you know, not at all as it's portrayed. So it, I think it's plausible that Murdoch did actually commit suicide, okay? And six officer Moody, who was the other guy that was on duty at that time, he allegedly drowned, but nobody ever saw him drown. But he just disappeared, which left Quartermaster Oliver, who said, I saw nothing. Helmsman Hitchens, who was immediately transferred to a job as a harbour master in Cape Town. What a promotion. Huh? Look out Frederick Fleet, who was very, very intransigent, intransigent at the inquiries. And look out Reginald Lee, who was equally intransigent and wouldn't answer questions. Okay. As I say, they could all have been easily been coerced or bribed. Okay. So, after the alleged collision with the iceberg, Captain Smith ordered Titanic half speed ahead for five minutes, which is a really strange thing to do. Why would you do that when there's a huge 300 foot gash in your ship? All you're going to do is force even more water through the hole. So again, that's rather inexplicable unless you believe that the whole thing was a setup or a false flag. Okay. Was he actually trying to get closer to the Californian? We'll never know. Or was he trying to sink the ship even quicker? We'll never know. Okay. Then, a ship was spotted on the horizon and he immediately ordered the engines closed down, which again is really strange behavior, I believe. Okay. It's all very confusing. So let's have a quick recap. Okay, so we've got a ship standing dead in the water. We've got a potential rescue ship standing by. Messages sent from California stating its position. And Smith could now see a stationary ship on the horizon. He assumes it's Californian, and this is therefore everything going to plan. He assumes it so. Okay. Now, Titanic did launch its rockets, but it actually started sending out coloured signal rockets, red, white, and blue, not just white. This is significant. I'll explain why in a moment. Now, Californian's crew did spot signal rockets, but they were only white ones. <laughs> Why would that be? Right. Captain Law repeatedly asked his crew the colour of the distress rockets. Was he expecting red, white and blue? Because every time he asked and he got the answer white only, he did nothing. And Titanic has definitely been confirmed as sending out red, white and blue signals. So what on earth were those, were those white rock signal rockets? Were they from another ship in distress? Right, okay. Again, this is not very clear, but here we have the Californian. Here we have Titanic's reported position. Here we have its actual position. Here was a Mount Temple, another ship that was nearby, and here we have a small seal hunting ship immediately between, exactly between Californian and Titanic called Samson, which was a seal hunt, an illegal seal hunting ship. Right? Now, for those of you who believe in the globe Earth, that's a very interesting graphic. Uh, <laughs> I'll skip past that one. But the Samson, as I say, it was an illegal seal hunting boat. Now, but no one knew about the Samson until months and months and months after the disaster. Um, it was discovered later that it was actually in the ice field and it was sending up white rocket signals. Why would it do this? 
to recall her small rowing boat um, because they sent little rowing boats out from the big ship out to the ice flows where all the crew were hunting the seal cubs and doing that dreadful thing with the clubs to get their pelts. Um, so that was illegal even then. Um, so that's why he never came forward because they were involved in illegal activities. But the captain later said that he had seen coloured rockets. So obviously the position that he was in, it was possible to see the coloured rockets, but California was too far away. As I say, he didn't come forward because he was engaged in illegal activity. But the Californian crew remained adamant to the end that only eight white rockets were seen, whereas Titanic sent up something like 20, I can't remember the exact amount, something like 24 coloured rockets. No, 22, there you go. <laughs> Two out, it's not bad. Alright, now, interestingly, did Titanic even hit an iceberg? Well, how ridiculous, of course it did. That's what we've been told, isn't it? For the last hundred and goodness knows how many years. I mean, the, the actual question itself has just got a bit preposterous, hasn't it? Did it even hit an iceberg? My goodness. Okay. As I say, there were only four working class witnesses. The lookout, Frederick Fleet, actually virtually refused to answer questions at the inquiries. Quartermaster Oliver said he saw nothing at all. And Hitchens departed for his new job as harbour master in South America before the British inquiry. And the other lookout, Reginald Lee, gave totally conflicting testimony at both inquiries. So who do we believe? But going back to the iceberg thing, there were copious amounts of ice on the deck. It's, it's there in all the Titanic legends. We know that there was ice skating about on the deck and people were making jokes about going outside to fetch a piece of ice for the gin and tonics, etc, etc. We know that that did happen. But now, where would that ice have come from? Well, Titanic had an enormous wireless antenna which stretched the whole length of the ship. And it also had lots of deck outbuildings. Now, bearing in mind that the temperature was only 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is something like minus, minus 3 centigrade, ice was building up everywhere on the outside of that ship. It was a very, very cold night. And don't forget the engines were thrust into reverse. So what happens is, when imagine putting your car in reverse when you're doing 60 miles an hour down the motorway. That was the effect. So any ice buildup on anything is going to get dislodged, so maybe that's where the ice came from. There are stories about working class lads kicking big lumps of ice around the decks, playing soccer with it, blah blah blah. Okay, so the, yeah, there were plenty of witnesses to all that. Um, yeah, and, but again, a good argument to say that it didn't hit an iceberg was the fact that on any ship at that time, the forwardmost two lifeboats, in other words, on the port side of the front and at the starboard side of the front, were always swung out on their davits. Okay, so they weren't tucked in to the deck of the ship, as all the other lifeboats were. These were swung out, way beyond the deck rails. Now, both those two lifeboats survived and were used in the rescue, uh, in, the, in the survival attempts. If it had hit an iceberg, the first thing the iceberg would have done would have destroyed the starboard lifeboat. There's no question about it. So, I don't know, I'm start, I, I started to kind of disbelieve the idea that an iceberg even figured. But I, 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 then I came to the conclusion that I think there was an iceberg and it definitely, if not hit it, it definitely steered close to an iceberg. But I'm still not convinced that it hit an iceberg at all. Okay, now, interestingly, there are several contemporary newspaper reports because I spent months trawling through all the different contemporary newspaper reports about the Titanic disaster. Uh, and several of these reports mention a mysterious, what they described as a yellow funnel steamer, which was seen in the aftermath of the collision, which never made any attempts to rescue anybody. There were people freezing to death in the sea. Uh, also, in the lifeboats, it never made any attempt at all to rescue anyone, um, but plenty of people saw it. 
Uh, so was this a British naval presence? We don't know. Interestingly enough, there was another lifeboat that the uh, Carpathia, which was the ship that actually rescued all the survivors, uh, actually picked up, and that was, but it was definitely not from the Titanic, because it was a different size and a different colour and a different design to the Titanic ones. So again, that's all a bit of a mystery. Nobody knows what really what that was all about. Yeah, as I said, all the ice on the deck could have been from any collision, not just an iceberg. So, was the yellow funnel steam? This is another possible, uh, shall we say, uh, solution to the issue. Was it some kind of an icebreaker that holds the ship? Or a ramming device of some kind? We'll never know. I'm just putting all this stuff out here as uh, you know, possibilities. But we do know that the, the official story is not as they tell us. Now, interestingly, Edith Russell, who was one of the famous survivors, I mean, she only died fairly recently. I mean, she was a, she was a young girl. She was about eight years old when this happened. And she said that the officers told her that the Californian was on its way to pick up everyone, so not to worry. Now, this is very interesting, isn't it? Because nobody, the Californian, had not been in contact with Titanic, other than to send three messages with its location that never reached the captain, because the wireless, uh, the wireless operators were too busy sending personal passenger messages out. So that's quite an interesting one. How did they know the Californian was on its way, unless they'd been told well in advance that that was going to be the case? Okay. Now, the lifeboats were sent out less than half full, which again, some people find very difficult to explain, and I have a little theory about that, why that was. And I believe it's because Smith had seen what he thought was the Californian on the horizon, but which actually wasn't. We'll never know what it actually was that he saw. But did he think that by putting the lifeboats into the sea less than half full, they could row to the California Californian much quicker, I don't know. It's, uh, it's an interesting one. Okay. But the California was in fact stopped 19 miles away, which was way below the horizon, uh, or way beyond the horizon. And was Lord still waiting for his coloured rockets? I believe so. But it finally dawned on Smith that no ship was going to arrive in time. Um, and at 5.30 a.m., Captain Lord of the Californian discovered to his horror that Titanic had sunk. And at this point in time, Carpathia was just re reaching the lifeboats with the few survivors on them. Uh, all the lifeboat passengers were brought aboard and those that needed it were given medical aid. Now, Ismay, Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the uh, White Star Line, was allegedly taken to the doctor's cabin and sedated. But he, he spent most of the voyage to New York from there, squirreled away in that cabin, holding conferences with White Oller, who was the senior most surviving officer, and several other people, key witnesses. So they were obviously, in my, to, to my way of thinking, they, they were obviously concocting some sort of cover story. Um, so on arrival at New York, all the crew were subpoenaed to attend an official inquiry which was due to take place a couple of days later. So it was a very, very quick thing. Okay, now, <laughs> I seem to have a duplicate slide there, I do apologise. Okay. Just an interesting photograph there of the, uh, the first Titanic lifeboat reaching the Carpathia, which is quite a po poignant picture. So I just thought I'd put that in there out of interest. It doesn't really mean anything. Now, at the American Inquiry, Witnesses were restricted, again, you might find this very, very strange, I certainly did. Witnesses were restricted to answering questions without elaboration at all. Okay, 
So, in other words, they were only allowed to answer yes or no and not add their own little bits in. Lightoller, the senior surviving officer, was very evasive. He was caught out lying a few times, but again, he was allowed to get away with it. He was given a very easy ride. And he actually claimed he was in the water for almost an hour before he managed to get on, a, on an upturned lifeboat, uh, which is most definitely a lie because the life expectancy in water of that temperature was 10 minutes. It was so cold, it was 28 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 3 degrees centigrade. Okay. All of those of you who have seen the actual the James Cameron film, uh, The Titanic with Jack and Rose, when Rose is laying on the, on the door at the, uh, after the ship's gone down and she's trying to get Jack up onto the door, he actually freezes to death while they are there. So, yeah, that's what happened. Most people think that everyone drowned. No, they didn't. Some obviously did drown. But the vast majority of them froze to death in those waters. Okay. So, yeah, it was totally impossible that it was in, in the water for almost an hour. Okay. So, light tower. <laughs> It's rich coming from him, I know, but he afterwards referred to the inquiry as a complete farce. Okay, totally contradictory evidence given by so many of the crew. Lookout Frederick Fleet, as I alluded to earlier, was very, very intransigent. Now, interestingly, some experienced sea captains were brought on board to give testimony to the inquiry, and they were asked questions, and they all said the same, that icebergs of the size that so allegedly sank Titanic can be seen three to five miles away, even on moonless nights, and that it was normal procedure to maintain full speed throughout an ice field. So why and how did Titanic actually hit the iceberg? That would be my question. We'll never know. We'll never know. Now. On arriving home back in the UK about two weeks later, the surviving crew members all docked at Plymouth and they were immediately detained against their will overnight in a holding pen in Plymouth docks. And they were illegally denied access to their union reps and they were forced to sign a document that they believed to be the Official Secrets Act, which actually prevented them from going to the press, from going to, from saying anything, even to friends and family, about what they saw or what really happened that night. This all speaks volumes to me. Were they threatened or bribed? Of course they bloody well were. Now the British Inquiry took place under the control of the Board of Trade. Uh, it was chaired by a guy called Ward Mersey, who they always wheeled in for any cover-up that they had going, the British government at that time. He was, he was a man who could be real, relied upon to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that the whole thing was a whitewash. Now, it's a fact that the large loss of life was, in part, due to inadequate Board of Trade lifeboat regulations. Now, as a lot of you may know, Titanic's lifeboats were only enough for about half the people that were on board, and only about a quarter if it had been full. Um, so it was kind of, the Board of Trade was partly to blame, because obviously more people could have been rescued if they had more lifeboats. Okay, so it's highly unlikely that the Board of Trade would be impartial in anything uh, resembling a, 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 an inquiry of this nature. Now the venue was the Drill Hall in London and the acoustics apparently were so poor that spectators and press could not even follow the proceedings. They couldn't hear what was going on. Obviously this was in the days before electronic sound amplification uh, but nevertheless it was a particularly poor venue to be chosen unless you were interested in really concealing the truth from the press. Okay. So both inquiries at the time were regarded as a whitewash. And Harold Sanderson, who was the White Star Line director, during his testimony, frequently referred to Titanic as Olympic. Well done, Harold. 
there's Lord Mersey. And that's an actual photograph of the inquiry taking place at the drill hall in London. Okay. So, yeah, the whitewash basically stated that Captain Smith wasn't to blame for the disaster, the lookouts weren't to blame, the design and construction of Titanic was not to blame, the officers and crew of Titanic were not to blame, White Star Line was not to blame, but Captain Lord of the California, he was the real culprit. And Mersey deliberately steered all the evidence that way. And anything that was said that didn't fit the official version was ignored by him or he just shouted them down. And again, no witnesses were allowed to elaborate on any of their answers. If they tried to, they were very quickly shut up. Okay. So it also had the effect of de deflecting attention away from several of the critical points. The Titanic's bulkheads should have been at least one deck higher. <coughs> and that the Board of Trade signed off the ship with just a cursory inspection. And I refer here to the one to two hour sea trial that should have lasted a full day. Now, we're, we're getting there now. So <laughs> we're not too far away, so just keep your patience going for a little bit longer, folks. Soon we're done. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, it's absolutely impossible this could have happened with the, without the collusion of the government. The Liberal government of the day knew that if White Star and Harland and Wolf had been bankrupted, there would have been massive political repercussions. And it would have put 25 to 30,000 30, people out of work, plus all the dependent industries. So a huge amount of people would have been out of work had the White Star line gone down. Okay, and the Liberals probably wouldn't have been re-elected. So nothing much changes in politics, does it? You know, they don't mind what, you know, they'll do anything to, you know, stay in power. But equally, and if not more importantly, we're going back here now to J.P. Morgan's agreement with the British government when he took over the ownership of the White Star Line. It, the agreement actually was, and he agreed that in upon taking over the White Star Line, that any White Star Line ship could be requisitioned as troop carriers in the event of war. Okay. The British government knew at this time, even though it was two years away, that war, and it was more than two years away, but they knew that war was coming because of what I said before. Real history tells us that the financiers have been planning World War I for at least two decades. Okay. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank, just to re refresh your memories, was a stepping stone to bring this about. And the government knew that if White Star Line, Harland and Wolf went bust, that JP Morgan was the major creditor as owner of IMM, which is International Mer Mercantile Marine, and which is the umbrella company of the White Star Line and that he would exercise his rights to seize his assets, the ships themselves. So the government would therefore lose their troop ships. So I believe that the government therefore fixed both inquiries in collusion with the US government. Where have we heard this story before? Oh dear me. Now, getting there now, only a few minutes to go, Let's talk a little bit about the insurance scam. Now, Titanic cost 2.5 million pounds to build. The badly damaged Olympic was uninsurable. White Star Line normally insured ships for only 75% of the volume. So the payout for Titanic would have been around 1.8 million. But the insurance on Titanic was upped the week before the maiden voyage to 3.2 million. Pounds. Shades of 9-11 and that lovely guy, Larry Silverstein and the Twin Towers, methinks. Okay. Now this is paid out within a week of the disaster. Now, 
I remember a few years ago I spilled some red wine on a white carpet and it took them two months to pay me 300 quid. Now they paid that amount of money out within a week. Yeah, okay. Going back to the discovery of the wreck, discovered in 1985 by Robert Ballard. I'm trying to try and skip through this because I've been told to get off, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry it's taking so long. Okay. Now, it was in poor condition after 73 years on the seabed at that point in time. Uh, Grey undercoat used only on Olympic, but Titanic's was black. Now, photograph of the marble fireplace in Ismay's cabin on Titanic um, was identical to the photograph on, in Ismay's uh, cabin on the Olympic. Now there are no two pieces of marble that I'm aware of that have exactly the same markings, but apparently they were identical. I'm going to skip past a lot of these stuff, but this, this is interesting. Now Ballard was puzzled because he had blueprints of the ship with him, the original build blueprints. He was puzzled that when he, when he examined the wreck, he saw longitudinal keel braces that weren't in the original blueprints. And these were the, these were the keel braces that were used to brace the Titanic. To, to the Olympic, sorry. Oh, I'm going to skip past some of this now because I'm running out of time. Okay. Now, the damage to the Titanic was very strange for iceberg damage. The, it penetrated five foot into the ship for a start. That would be a very strange piece of ice that could do that and yet make a hole only four inches wide, which is what happened. Uh, you know, a very strange piece of ice. And, and it was a, around 200 feet, possibly more, in length. Um, how could that be possible with ice damage? Now, Olympic, when it was launched, had grey undercoat. Titanic was launched, had black undercoat. Now this is a picture of Olympic in Southampton in 1929 and there we have the old 14 portals again. So this is allegedly Olympic but of course it's really Titanic. Picture of the wreck. Now the pictures of the wreck show clearly show grey undercoat showing through. Now only Olympic had grey undercoat. Some of this stuff is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just finish off. Let me just finish off. Sorry. I'll skip through these. So without serious opposition, the Federal Reserve Act was quietly passed by Congress on the 23rd of December 1913, and that was the beginning of the American national debt, which is now $27 trillion. And this enabled the bankers to fund World War I and has been planned for several decades. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to stop. Um, it's a bit disappointing, to be honest, because, I, I'm sorry I couldn't round it off properly, but I've been told that I've got to end it, so. But anyway, thank you very much. I guess we can't take questions. Uh, does anybody smell a rat? A little bit suspicious. I think it's like sort of, uh, it's reminiscent of everything that happens these days. Thank you very much, John. I know it's a very deep, involved subject. Um, There's lots of parts of this that I was aware of, but that mixed them all together.